My name is Michael Gately. I'm the executive director of Bio, Biographers International Organization, which uh, aims to promote the art and craft of biography, cultivate a diverse community of biographers, encourage public interest in biography, and provide educational and fellowship opportunities for biographers worldwide. Uh, it's great to see so many Bio members. Um, and if you're not yet a member of Bio, um, we encourage you to join. And I'll put a link to our website um, in the chat. Um, this evening's bio zoom workshop series on reading biographers reading biographies like a writer uh, Ann Zimmerman will discuss with Ann Boyd Rue what biographers can learn about the craft from Julia Cook's uh, Come Fly the World the jet age story of the women of Pan Am which tells the story of several ordinary women who embraced the liberation of a jet set life by working as stewardesses for Pan Am Airlines. Um, Ann Boyd Rue is a member of BIO's board of directors, a BIO coach, and the author of Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters, which was chosen as one of the best books of 2018 by the Daily Mail and Library Journal. Her biography, Constance Fenimore Wilson, Portrait of a Lady Novelist, was chosen as one of the 10 best books of 2016 by the Chicago Tribune. She's the recipient of four National Endowment for the Humanities Awards, two for public scholarship. You can find her online at anpudru.com. It's my pleasure now to turn the evening over to Anne boyd Rue. Anne? Hi, hey everybody. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces and some names that I recognize but haven't met you yet. So this is it's fun to see everybody virtually. Um, and feel free to turn on your video if you wish, but it's obviously not necessary. It's always nice to see that there are real people <laughs> out there. And um, so Anne Zimmerman has agreed to join us. And... Um, just to tell you how this came to be. I mean, the series, uh, Reading Biography Like a Writer, is something that came to be through discussions with the coaches. So Bio has a coaching program and uh, you can you know, you get a bit of a discount as a Bio member um, in your first hour of coaching uh, with these seasoned biographers. I'm, I'm one of the coaches and I asked the coaches, you know, what is it that our, um, that our membership really uh, could use from us? What's a, a, a different way that we could use this opportunity to gather um, on Zoom doing workshops that, you know, wouldn't be like the conference. And something that came up in our discussion was over and over again is they, they wish that, um, that many people, especially new biographers, uh, you know, could read biographies and really learn from them what it means to read them closely and read them like a writer and really see what it, uh, what different biographers are doing and what techniques they're using and learn from them and borrow from them. And I think we get so mired in our own research, we get overwhelmed with all the material we have to read, right? That's certainly been my experience um, that we put, you know, reading other current biographies on, um, you know, in the background or on the back shelf. So I'm really excited that Ann Zimmerman um, could join us tonight. Uh, she's, I found her on Instagram, actually. We, we follow each other. I can't remember how that happened. <laughs> you know, all those things go. And I, um, I saw her post something about a class that she's teaching on writing biography um, at Stanford. I think it's the Stanford Continuing Education Program. And so I reached out to her and asked her if there was a book she was teaching and um, if she'd like to join us. And so that's kind of how, how this connection came to be. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about Anne. Um, her information was in the registration page, but perhaps you know, you've forgotten about that now. But she's the author of a wonderful biography, An Extravagant Hunger, The Passionate Years of MFK Fisher that was published by CounterPoint. And she's done a really great interview um, about that book and MFK Fisher on the, um, is it Lost Literary Ladies or Lost, Lost Ladies? Ladies of Lit. Lost Ladies of Lit podcast. podcast. Yeah. And I actually heard that before I saw you post about teaching this class. And I really liked that interview. Um, but that was, um, uh, that was sort of the beginning, I guess, of her um, production of books about MFK Fisher. She's um, edited two subsequent collections of her book, of her work. Um, Love in a Dish, uh, The Culinary Delights, and MFK Fisher, Musings on Wine and Other Libations. Um, and she lives in Portland, Oregon, has taught for many years in the Stanford University's Continuing Studies program, including this course on biography writing. Um, so 
let's talk about this class that you're teaching and why you chose this book um, as the main text or the one sort of book link work that your students would read. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you all for being here. Um, I hope it can be helpful as you are starting or continuing in whatever project you're working on. Um, so the class that I teach is loosely modeled on a class that I took when I was in graduate school that was called Narrating Women's Lives. I got my master's in women's studies. Um, so it was a more, um, it was a class more focused on specifically women's lives. And that class was taught by Susan Califf, who was a biographer, um, is a biographer. She wrote, um, a book about Babe Didrikson Zaharias, who was the first woman all sport, all sport athlete. And that book was nominated for the Pulitzer. So she kind of was a mentor to me and taught me um, more about research and more about biographical writing skills and was actually the person that kind of looked at my research and looked at my writing and said, this could be a book, you know, your point of view um, matters. And if you want to take the time, this can become something bigger. So um, I owe, you know, a, grat a huge amount of gratitude to her. But um, the class that I teach um, is called typically writing the lives of others. Um, and I've taught it every few years for about a decade. Um, and it began, to be honest, as a more serious biography writing course. But I quickly discovered, um, or was, I guess, reminded of the fact that writing a biography takes a huge amount of research and as a result a huge amount of time much more time than can typically um, be fit into a 10-week quarter um, and resources and you know just all it, you you all know you're working on them it, it's it's years if not decades of your life um, and most of the people who take my class are actually doing that because they have a, an interest in family history. That's not exclusively true. Um, I had a student once working on um, a biography about Julia Morgan. I have had some um, people wanting to write about more um, serious quote unquote figures, but 90% of the time it's people wanting to write about people in their family, dead or alive. Um, and the archives that they have to work with are photographs and letters and journals and interviews and memory, family stories, that type of thing. So over the years, the class, which is um, coded as a creative writing class, has become a really interesting blend of academics and sort of talking about interviews and talking about research and um, interesting this year, especially talking so much about truth and you know what is the what is the truth and how do we kind of like dig into that messiness, but also um, writing and creative writing and sometimes like breaking free of um, the academia to talk about how to take all of this information that you have and write really 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 engaging prose that you know, readers want to read. Um, so because of all that, picking a book becomes real, a really calculated thing for me <laughs> because there are so many things that I'm thinking about. And to be honest, one of the first things is length. It's a 10 week course. I also um, assign a craft book. We also do, you know, each week we do writing assignments and discussion questions and Zooms and people have there it's a continuing studies course so most people have lives and families and children so uh something that is not too long um and i also look to see it you know I, I have my eye on diversity i have my eye on a story that is going to be interesting to people um of different ages and also different you know backgrounds um, but really, and where this book comes into play, really what I'm looking for is books around about lesser known figures. Um, I think it's very um, easy for a student to go to the bookstore or go online and find, you know, a wonderful biography about someone that's famous um, and read that book and be really daunted by how to make their own grandmother um, into a story like that. And so I really look for biographies that have characters that are everyday and ordinary to show how they can bring their own stories to life. Right, and maybe make those ordinary lives extraordinary enough yes. to warn a book, right? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I definitely, I'm, um, 
I mean, the thing that I have learned from 10 years of teaching this class and other classes and focused on nonfiction is that I really do believe um, that, you know, true stories are the best stories and everyone, every life has something that's obviously fascinating and dramatic and dynamic and that can be written about. And, you know, it, the, it's a dish about finding that story. Right, right. Finding the story, I think, is the important thing because we come across the interesting people that we're drawn to, but an editor is not going to buy our book because we found an interesting person, right? We have to tell them an interesting story about that person. And that is, I think, what this series is really about because we, it's, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, is taking all of that research, as you said, crafting it into a story. So, um, so we'll look at how she does that here in this book. And I didn't, I did want to mention that Julia Cook, the author, is planning to join us this evening. And um, I believe she won't be able, she's not able to make it right at the top of the um of the of the webinar of the Zoom workshop. So she'll be joining us in a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to say that uh you welcome to use the chat function for any comments or questions. And uh and we're hoping to um I have a you know plenty of time for questions at the end, and you know we might be able to ask Julia a question or two about her you know research methodology, how she structured the book, or choices that she made, that kind of thing, um, that are focused on craft and progress might be interesting things to you know ask her if she's willing to talk a little bit too. So, I just wanted to mention that. So, um, so you chose this book because it was about lesser known figures and. And it's really well told. I'm assuming those are the main reasons, um, and probably the the most important part of a book is the beginning, right? Because nobody's going to read it if they can't you know, get drawn in right away. So, do you want to um, do you want to look at the beginning? And I think you were going to maybe read a passage for us and mm -hmm. talk a little bit uh, about so well there. Yeah, I mean, I think you you basically took the words right out of my mouth that like you know it's the it's the beginning is so important, but it's actually a broader question of why I liked the book in general. You know, it did have this great beginning that was really engaging and really sucked me in. But um, just sort of anecdotally, it goes without saying that as I reread the book and prepared to teach and prepared to have this conversation, it became so abundantly clear that um, what must have been also motivating me was just the idea of travel. And I personally have not traveled <laughs> in uh yeah, I've not been on a plane since um, December of 2019. Um, so, it, so it is kind of interesting. It was it was interesting to reread this book in the past few weeks through the lens of um, realizing that for me at least, travel has, in some ways become as exotic as it probably was <laughs> to some of these women and some of these people who are really going out and seeing the world for the very first time. So um, if you did read the book, I hope you had a similar experience of um, armchair travel and just yes, sort of definitely. transported. Um, let's read the beginning and then we can talk about, um, do you want me to read and then tell you what kind of jumps out at me or do you want me to interject? I'll probably read first and that way I won't um, confuse Julia's. Sure. Um, I'll just do like the first three paragraphs I think of what is what I had marked. Um, Lynn Totten stood in the doorway for what felt like a very long time, looking at the women sitting in rows in front of her, only minutes before, she had walked confidently down Park Avenue to the Pan Am building, an octagonal skyscraper of broad, faceted glass and concrete. As Lynn approached the 59-story building's shadow, she took in the enormous letters of the company's name at its crown. She'd walked through the Pan Am lobby and taken the elevator up to the offices above as if she knew where she was going and what she was doing. Now Lynn stood facing Beaufonts and elegant French twists. As she headed to the front of the room, she saw the faces of the women who wore them, perfect eye makeup. Lynn, short and dainty in her brown suede skirt with long dark hair down her back. She had not thought to pull it up into a bun, considered the reality of where she stood waiting to be interviewed for a job as a stewardess. How can you change a world you've never seen? A Pan Am magazine ad read. This was the yearning that had sent Lynn to the interview. On television, the same campaign asked, why don't you join the country club? A golfer on a green field was quickly surrounded by people in varied international looking clothing. Men in the striped shirts of 
Italian Vaporetto drivers or in the Baroque military jackets, women in Japanese yukata, big countries, small countries, old countries, new countries. Um, I'm gonna stop there, but I think for me, and I would love to know what your reactions were also, Anne, but I think um, just within the first two sentences, I felt like I was, you know, walking down the streets in New York, looking up at that big building, um, just right there with this woman who I don't even know anything about yet. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen, but just sort of into the drama of walking into that building, going to this interview, and then kind of immediately sensing that there were, that Lynn was different from everybody else. And then I loved the sort of um, introduction of some of the um, issues of ambition and kind of coded in with feminism um, of as if she knew where she was going and what she was doing. And to me, that line was so important because it set up this, um, you know, sort of line about like the country bumpkin versus the sophisticated women, the roles that were available to women, um, the jobs that were acceptable. I talk a lot about this in the book, you know, what kind of women were um, flight attendants and um, were they smart women? Were they, you know, quote unquote, loose women? Um, and then in the, in the next paragraphs, I think for me, it was just those really specific details, the bouffants, the French twists, the fact that she hadn't tied up her hair, you know, the eye make, makeup versus the suede skirt. So you get this idea that there's this like room of sort of like dolls and Lynn is like more of maybe um, not necessarily overtly a hippie, but maybe just a little bit more wholesome, a little bit more um, understated. Uh, and then I thought it was really great how she brought in the Pan Am advertisements and sort of used that to kind of up the glamour of um, how a person, a woman would see these advertisements and want to be um, on that ride. The thing that I did think was interesting, um, two things, and I don't know if anybody else noticed this throughout the reading of the book, but I noticed that um, that. I think if I was editing this, I would put the year in sooner. Um, I mean, really it comes like at the beginning of the second page, but just like such a small um, nitpicky thing. And then- um, you know, Right, I mean, she gives us little clues about the era. Right. I guess I, yeah, the bouffant, an elegant French twist hair really kind of puts it in a particular moment in a way. Yeah, but I, yeah, I kind of, I, I mean, I really love how she's drawing us in through the eyes of one of her characters, right? So this is a group biography. Um, you, you know, you could call it a group biography um, in a lot of respects. I mean, she's interested in Pan Am stewardesses of a particular era, and she chose to focus on three in particular. And then there are two others who come up um, at important moments to kind of give us other perspectives. But Lynn Totten is one of them. And, you know, maybe when Julia comes on we can ask her you know, why she picked Lynn or this particular moment I think it's 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 well one one really effective way to start a book right is the moment at which the story really begins so not starting with some deep background about her right but the moment she walks into the building to interview for the job <laughs> right that's kind of the tipping point of the story where the where the action really takes off yeah yeah, I mean, one thing that I did think about, um, and I don't, this was, you know, on much deeper introspection as I was preparing for this conversation, but I did wonder um, if Julia Cook ever thought about starting the book on an airplane, you know, in, in air. And um, yeah, because that seems, maybe that's too obvious, but um, it is, you know, another that's another way of looking at that. Like, what is the moment that the story really begins? Right. Well, this frames it, I think, as you pointed out, with this moment when women's roles are changing, yes. right? And it's giving them the opportunity to see the world. So that really sets the tone, I think. And she carries that out, really. And there's more contrast because she's able to contrast um, literally ground to sky, <laughs> you know, the, the concrete world versus the more otherworldly, but also the 
the the different types of, of women in just you know a line or two she can sketch that and it becomes clear well so she's painting a scene and a scene is such an effective way to start a book and one of the hardest thing i think for biographers is to write a scene mm-hmm. because scene is not something that we're you know we're taught to do unless we study fiction right um so what she's really doing is using many of the techniques of fiction here yeah. to paint a scene. So what makes a good scene? If you can just sort of break it down into some of the um, elements. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that when when I'm talking to my students and some pieces of advice that that someone gave me was that when readers are reading, they don't attract or attach themselves to generalities they attach themselves to specifics. Um, And so the more specific you can be, um, that is what the reader will not only remember after they have read the book, but also what will keep them reading. And, And I mean, you can just see it in, if you, you know, like if the first, if the first paragraph of the book was boiled down to a sentence that was like a woman walked through a door, like that's not interesting. <laughs> um, you, could have, you could have summed up the whole first few paragraphs with Lynn Totten applied for or interviewed for a job. A job, yeah. That's it. That's yeah. the fact. And yep. the rest of it is the scene that puts us in her experience by giving us sensory details, right? Sensory and, details and um as as mentioned, um sort of how would you describe it? I mean, things like the bouffants that are also emblematic of the times, you know, not just hair piled on top of their head, like a very specific name for the hairdo. Um, and the, I mean, they're just, you know, you can, you, you probably can't see my book, but if you can, you can see that it's just underlined, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh-huh. like octog- octagonal skyscraper, broad faceted glass, concrete, 59 story building, enormous letters of the company's name. Um, that over the building yeah I can just sort of imagine that yeah Mm -hmm. I would if you don't know what it looks like it is worth googling I did google it to kind of really get the picture and she's also taking us inside her character a little bit excuse me um she she walked as you said before as if she knew where she was going and what she was doing Yeah. And I think that that is a really interesting point because I think that that, and I'm sure you would agree is like, that is the benefit. I think we could ask Julia if she joins us, but that is the benefit to being able to interview somebody because you can die, you know, you can dig into like, you can add, you know, you can dig into like, well, what were you thinking and how did you feel? Um, and that is much harder when, um, you know, just to use like the students in my class as an example, that is much harder if you're writing about the grandfather that died when you were eight, because then you are kind of up against this, like, um, you're up against this wall of like, what are the facts and what is the more creative, like, what do I think my, you know, the person was thinking the speculation and and when does it become fiction and what are we allowed to do as we're writing, as we're writing biographies and as we're writing about the truth. Right. Right. And that's handled by different writers and editors in different ways. Yes. Um, But you can see how she's, you know, obviously Lynn didn't give her, probably all the information about what she's describing here. She probably didn't tell her about the magazine ads, for instance, right? Right. She doesn't even say that she read the magazine ads and then she decided to apply, right? She's just kind of suggesting, you know, what would motivate Mm -hmm. these women to want to apply for these jobs by, you know, pulling back a little bit and showing us those ads. And that's what I thought, again, like, you know, I'm a pretty fast reader and I definitely read for story. And so the first time I read this book, I read for story and then going back over subsequent times, which, I mean, there's a tip right there. Like I, you know, you have to study, you know, ideally you like read for me, I read the book once to kind of understand what's happening. And then I go back and I look at it through more of like my like writerly glasses to kind of see how the author is actually building the book on the page. But um, that was one of the things that really struck me as I went back and revisited it is just this integration of 
all the different research and how well that was done. Um, you know, sliding the ad into this scene that has um, that is more from the point of view of one character, and then the different characters building together to tell this bigger story and the Vietnam level. Like there was a tremendous. All research books obviously have a tremendous amount of research, but I thought that it was um, really remarkable. I think that's what's hard about writing a biography is you're taking all of this information and you're you have to sort of um gather it obviously but then translate it in a way or I don't know if there's a word that you use it's like you have to braid it I mean I don't know what the right metaphorical um right word. well you have you have to select right yes. the right job is to select and to shape, mm -hmm. shape. um <clears throat> right and I can just imagine the mounds of research she must have had. But as you're reading along, you could kind of sometimes, as you know, as someone who's done this research before, you could just see her looking at, you know, magazines and looking at the ads and thinking, oh, that one really sums up yeah. <laughs> what Pan Am meant to, you know, to people at the time or what might have been drawn a woman to want to become a right. Pan Am artist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she probably read many, many ads, but she selected these that I think do work pretty well. So um, do you want to look at another scene? You had some others that you had one that was your favorite, you said. Yes, my favorite. Um, it's interesting because um, since I am teaching this book, I can um, I can tell you which one is the one that I keep like referring people to. And it is the one it is chapter nine, page 89 um, that is the the moon landing and i think this is the most well i'm not sure it's my favorite it's definitely the one that i am recommending most to students um because i do find sometimes especially at the beginning of projects um it doesn't matter if it's a family history project or a, a another subject but i do find that sometimes there's a little bit of a struggle in sort of figuring out who's going to be like the main character the main subject um or especially in family stories where you might have a variety of voices that are leading to you know the, the understanding of the family story um students will want to write about different people. And I thought that this was so great because it showed the lunar landing from numerous different perspectives, all sort of tiny different scenes. And if you have the book, again, I'm not sure that you can see, but what I thought was really interesting was even like the organization of it, how it scenes with some, some nice white space in between. So it was just very easy for the reader to understand. But um, I will read that just in case people did not um, get the chance to finish the book. Not the whole thing, but some of it. Um, around the world, 600 million people watched Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins land on the moon live on television. Soon, newspaper front pages in every country would carry the same images, the pocked surface of the moon, the white peaks of lunar mountains, the men's faces above the wide circular necks of their suits. On an airplane somewhere over the Pacific on July 20th, 1969, the stewardess had just served dinner when the pilot announced to his plane full of the U.S. Marines, full of U.S. Marines on their way to Vietnam, that Neil Armstrong had taken his first step on the moon's surface. The stewardess prepared in the science, the stewardess is prepared in the silence immediately after the announcement for a bright, loud cheer. Instead, the quiet stretched. An older man set his food on the floor, folded up his tray table and stood up. A oh, beautiful for spacious skies for amber waves of grain, he began. One by one, the others set their food on the floor and stood, all 164 of them. As the minutes ticked by, the men stood and sang. They went through all the patriotic songs they knew and ended with the Marine hymn, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. In the snow of far off Northern lands and in sunny tropic scenes, you will find us always on the job, the United States Marines. When the stewardesses walked down the aisle, she saw tears on the men's faces. They were heading to some place they had probably never heard of, she thought, to die for a confusing, likely doomed cause. And still, they had stood up to sing about America. She thought the purity of the moment set against the backdrop of the war that the men would soon enter would never leave her. Interestingly, did you notice that there's this character is not named? The subject is not named. I was just thinking about that. And I think it's interesting because the next three the paragraphs, next she tells us, you know, Karen, what Karen was doing, yep. you know, 
when, on the moon landing and what Lynn was doing and then what Tori was doing. Mm -hmm. Those are her three main characters, but this is such a perfect scene. How could you not use it? Even though it wasn't one of her main characters, right? <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, in some of these things, it's almost like, you know, it's like real, it's like, you know, real talk and shop, <laughs> you know, it's like the <laughs> most readers are maybe not going to notice that, but, um, but, but I did. And you did, obviously. Um, well, I'll no, just, I didn't the first time really. I read this, I, I read this aloud to my students on zoom on Monday and I, I'm not even sure I noticed it then. So this is like very much um, as I become more and more acquainted with it. I, should, should I read one more? Should I read one of the ones where the, the women, sure. the named yeah. ones? Okay. Karen, so this is the next, next paragraph, next section. Karen sat cross-legged on the floor of her New York apartment. Today, she was the only one home. The afternoon sun flared through the windows onto the dingy walls. Tears streaked her eyes as she watched the grainy images of the moon on TV. It was the same moon she had gazed at as a teenager on the cliffs of Santa Barbara, eager for experience. The moon that had pointed her towards Asia, the moon that represented all of the places she had already seen and those she had not. There's such a lot of world to see, the Johnny Mercer song went. Now uniforms hung in her closet, a vinyl bag with the Pan Am globe below them. Karen could bid flights to anywhere now, any city Pan Am serviced, anywhere on the globe above which Aldrin and Armstrong stood. Yeah, yeah. So she, later on, we will see the three women in the same place at the same time, which is kind of exciting when that happens. Yes. <laughs> at this point, you know, they're not, they're still not in the same room with, or on the same plane at the same time. So we're, you know, we're seeing them though. It's such an important, crucial moment. <clears throat> and then she goes into a longer story that focuses on Tori mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of brings, you know, focuses on her for many pages, right? So she's, some of the chapters see, are focused more on one of the women. I think the early chapters are like that, right? We, we get to know them each individually um, and we get to know the, um, what's her name? Celia or Cynthia, Claire, sorry, starts with a C. <laughs> Claire, I think. Claire's the there's other. Claire, there's Tori, there's Lynn, there's Hazel. Hazel's kind of like more of a... It's a little bit know, later, doesn't she? A little yeah. bit later. Um, yeah, I mean, you brought up the idea when we were kind of talking about this conversation about chronology. And I guess it's interesting because um, it is such a character-driven book. And I guess you could argue that um, character trumped chronology and that sounds negative I'm not sure if I mean it in a negative way but um the author was definitely had I assume you know made a choice to kind of not organize things completely chronologically yeah I think it's it's a really smart move and I I think it works particularly well because she is writing about a shorter time period right mm -hmm. yeah she's not taking us well into the I don't know how far we even get into the 70s, not that far. Not very far. And we don't go into the 80s or 90s. She kind of, you know, sort of flashes forward a bit near the end. But this is a story really about a particular historical moment, mm -hmm. which is such um, an important historical moment, right? When things were changing so rapidly for women, um, the Vietnam War, civil rights, um, yeah, all these lawsuits, um, you know, equal opportunity and things were coming up. So it's it's a really pivotal moment. And it's a pivotal moment for the air industry and I I couldn't help getting a little bit nostalgic because I remember flying on one of these 747s um yeah. when I went to Europe when I was very young <laughs> I was in the mid 80s and uh I was disappointed when I started doing international travel again um in the 2000 teens and I was just on a normal airplane I'm like wait a minute that was like that was such an amazing experience you could climb up the stairs and go to the lounge up above and you know it's like really it is so glamorous and like I mean a whole city flying yeah. In the air. yeah it was glamorous and it felt like such an adventure and now you're just on a normal plane like you could be flying to Detroit you know mm -hmm. <laughs> this doesn't feel special but she captures I think this era that we have some nostalgia about at the same time that she's exposing a lot of the tensions of the period and the stuff about Vietnam was so um moving Pence with these women experienced flying soldiers in and out of Vietnam. Yeah. I mean, and I think also, um, not to, not to, to move away from the Vietnam thing, but, um, you know, I think 
we're about the same age. And I mean, I just remember my mother telling me, you know, like women could be teachers or stewardesses. I mean, you know, that was sort of the career growing up in the South um, in around this time. I mean, it, I, I haven't actually done the math until right this minute, but I, but my guess is that the women profiled in this book are like very much my own mother's contemporaries and that um, there were just, you know, limited career choices and um, working as a flight attendant um, was not viewed as maybe the, the most wholesome, you know, at least compared to a, being a teacher, for example, or, or staying at home. Um, and that's, so that I thought that was kind of very interesting to sort of blow apart that whole idea, even today that, you know, the, the you know, when we get on a plane, we put our lives in the hands of people and, um, you know, and what that looks like. So it was a real, for me, like a lifting of a curtain, um, both of the, you know, the feminist movement and, and the normal people that sort of broke the mold for people um, of my generation and the generations to come, but also kind of an interrogation of what those roles were and what we still tend, the stereotypes we still have today, even I think when we get on a plane today about who some of these people are and, and the jobs that they're doing and their, you know, importance as compared to others. So, um, right. Right. Yeah. I did want to, um, see, I did want to point out something that happens a few pages later, something that I noticed where I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I had my biographer glasses on, I guess, as I was reading at that moment and noticed her, um, it's on page 94 and she's been telling us Tori's story very much in, in kind of the same moment, right? She's kind of taking us through what she's going through um, during this time. And then um, she pulls back for context in that last paragraph on 94. If Tori had arrived in New York even five years earlier, she might've lived in one of the city's many women's hotels where young women's parents allowed them to stay because there as Sylvia Plath wrote in the bell jar, Men couldn't get at them and deceive them. Now apartments shared by single women fizzed with new autonomy amid a historic loosening. So this paragraph isn't about Tory, but it's just one paragraph and it goes on to the next page. And it gives us so much useful context for understanding her uh, story and these women's stories, right? And I just thought that was so effective how she weaves it in. She uses some of the context sec um, sections are longer Mm -hmm. And if you were writing what you thought of as more of a straight biography, maybe you wouldn't spend quite as much time away from your characters. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at this section in chapter nine, I think about Tori, it's a good example of how you can pull back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, I, you called it context. Um, I call, I mean, I, sometimes I call it um, musing or commentary. I mean, I, I find different writers kind of like to just attach themselves to different labels in their work. But um, yeah, just that idea that as the author, you have to step in and I always kind of describe it as shining light on what's important, um, especially important and or um, sort of gently reminding readers of things that they might know, but not actually be thinking about, um, especially when we're writing stories about things that happened in the past and people who lived in the past, these sort of gentle reminders of like, this was not, you know, things that were changing very quickly. <laughs> and Right, because this, this shows us that the writer was curious, right? Mm -hmm. Not just about, okay, what Tori's, you know, where Tori lived, um, what the building looked like, or, you know, that sort of thing, what her living arrangements were, who she lived with. That's not the entire story, right? Because then if we, she's wondering, well, what, what did, what, how did women live at this time if they were single in the yeah. city? You know, and then she probably did a little research into that and discovered that, well, maybe Sherry knew this, that, you know, um, women used to live in hotels just for women, um, right? So this was an unusual new thing, the way Tori was living. And that really is helpful and, and really, I think, ties in with this whole theme of, of a revolutionary period of times of great change. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was one that kind of jumped out at me. Did you want to look at another scene? We still have a little bit more time to dig into the book before we move to questions. And remember everybody, you can put questions in the chat and um, and we will discuss them uh, when we have time. Well, we talked about um, flashback. Um, so we could look um, at, let me find it. It's a, such a, um, 
such a pandemic moment, right? That I did not have post-it notes. And I was just like, I'm not going to the store. We're just going to have to live, live without post-it notes this time. <laughs> so I'm dealing with uh, paper clips, which are not nearly as helpful. Um, so you, we had talked about the idea of flashbacks, which are, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows, but just to, to orient everybody, you know, kind of like jumping then again, further back in time to provide information that the reader um, might need um, to understand the character, understand the scene. And one of my favorite flashbacks uh, moments in this book actually came um, at the beginning of chapter five. Um, and to just sort of set the scene, it starts. Um, page, what page? Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, page 48. Um, okay. Sorry. Um, to set the scene, so it's a, it's, it opens with a glamorous dinner party um, in West Africa. And the centerpiece of the table is a roast turkey that the stewardesses have flown in frozen from New York. Um, and it says they did this sometimes, brought party fixings from New York. Um, and then it kind of goes into like the sort of like more the off hours of what it was like to be a flight attendant that you would, you know, meet people, men sometimes and um, or just make friends in different, you know, towns, ports of call, so to speak, um, and that you would plan your the shifts that you work so that you might be able to socialize with these people. But what I thought was so great is that the turkey, the turkey centerpiece flown in from New York becomes this like really fascinating and brilliant, I thought, pivot <laughs> into Tori's past. Because on page 49, about uh, halfway down, there uh, there's a paragraph that or opens and says, Torald Werner, so Tori, had never seen a turkey before that night in October 1966. There were no turkeys in her native Norway. And this October had been only her fourth month living in New York, working as a Pan Am stewardess. And I just thought that was so, I mean, to me that, I mean, it's so funny. It's kind of like this funny detail. As I was making my notes, I was like, am I really going to talk about this turkey? Um, but just um, as someone who was, you know, <clears throat> Or like many of you, like actively writing most days, but also um, reading and thinking about writing. I thought it was just such this lovely moment of how you have to like really step back from the creative part of your work. You know, the 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 words that you're putting on the page, um, and and try new things and be sort of inventive and look for the connections and not be afraid to um, go out on a limb because maybe when the idea popped into our head to like transition with the turkey that seemed ridiculous um or no, it never worked right. but it does <laughs> any of those kind of links is so useful for the reader right because obviously she wants to go she wants to move from this larger picture that she's been describing these parties and things um and how they spend their time when they're in africa um and off the plains and she wants to bring us into, you know, zoom in on one of these, one of these stewardesses, right? Mm -hmm. And she does it with the turkey, which mm -hmm. is great, right? And, and I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but um, I actually have never been to Norway, nor have I ever been to West Africa, but I have had Turkey. And so, I mean, just from like a very broad readership point of view, it is kind of an interesting, um, good, but ordinary detail that sort of knits together the reader, whoever, you know, if you're just thinking about the idea of, you know, just um, the right. average reader in the best way possible, but someone who might be picking this up in January, 2022, not having traveled a lot or um, forgotten you know, what it was like to travel. And that these, again, these precise details that um, help create connections between the reader and the people that are, are being written about. Right, right. And then part of this chapter two is a close-up scene in quite in a lot of detail. One that really stood out to me. I think it's um, I guess it starts with the on 49. Yeah, it's probably the swimming scene. Yeah. Yeah, October 26th. She gives us a specific day. Um, right. And this is a really sort of uh frightening scene about you know getting pulled out. Um do they call those rip currents, right? She gets stuck in a, she gets pulled out on a, yeah. and so we see this, um, we see Tori in what we might think of as the present moment, right, in story time, more or less, 
um, in this close-up scene. And then she, um, well, here's another good example of one of these kind of interesting little transitions on 51, where she breaks, you know, away from the scene to pull back and give us some of Tori's backstory. She says a tan had led Tori to Pan Am the previous year. <laughs> She's just been talking about them, you know, sun tanning and, and getting tans and everything. And she really does some interesting stuff there about what the what a tan signifies and what it meant to her, right? So for somebody from Norway. Right. I had forgotten about that part. Yeah. I mean, the, the humanizing, I mean, you know, another way that you could think about details um, would just be the humanizing details. I mean, I think that like we've all read um, biographies about really important people that um, just sort of made it seem like they were otherworldly. And, and, and I, you know, in a way, I think that's, um, you know, people, there are iconic characters out there, but I think that um, we all read fiction, nonfiction, biography. We all read because we're trying to connect with other people, with other humans. Um, so at, at, yes, turkeys, tans. <laughs> um, I also thought that I, I actually don't have it marked. Um, I don't know if you do, but I thought from just like, sort of like, um, an emotional reader point of view, I thought the section, which was rather long about, um, now I can't, I can't actually remember which woman it is, but who goes through the breakup was so interesting because that was such a humanizing, um, Karen, right? Yes, Karen, um, humanizing moment that also was emblematic of the social and cultural changes of, of the time that she, that these this couple, you know, had cohabitated and chose not to marry. And, and she was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see the world. I'm going to see even more of the world. I'm going to go deeper. Um, see even the choices, right? About, yes. about their personal lives because, yeah directly impacts their job and their job directly impacts their personal relationships. Yeah. Yeah. So those become really, I think, important and interesting. And I think Tori didn't marry, right? She kind of I never married, I don't think. She stayed in her job. And it's interesting to see when they when they all sort of started, there were age limits and there were um prohibitions against getting married or getting pregnant. Yeah. Right. But we watched them we watch them start to push against these limits mm -hmm. and she pulls back in important times to give us the context of lawsuits. None of them initiated any lawsuits, right? But they were, the yeah. lawsuits were going on all around them, right? And so that's really kind of the, the sort of information that a reader needs to understand the significance, I guess, of what they were going through. Yes. Um, you know, just, just describing what's happening to them you know, then they got married or blah, blah, blah. But no, we understand how significant that was. The right. very yes. And they jobs after that. they got married. Mm -hmm. um, that was, I, I thought, um, uh, I don't know if I have this, I have a greater section marked, but I thought that that was such an interesting, when you, when you, um, it, we, we were talking about context. One of those like contextual details was when they're about to do Operation Baby Lift, and and sh and the Julia for just a moment sort of shines the light on a flight attendant who I do, I do think has a proper name, but is not one of the main character quote unquote flight attendants who is just a little bit pregnant, and she's trying to. She was like this was maybe even her last flight before she was going to admit to the bosses that she was pregnant, which she knew would end her career. Career. And then she had to decide if she was going to get on the Operation Baby Lift flight and what that would mean for her as um, a pregnant person, as a, as a future mother, how that might change the course of like not just her life, but her child's life if something were to happen. That too, right after another Operation Baby Lift plane had crashed and killed a right. lot of people. Yes. Board. Yes. And they were, yeah. Um, but, you know, just these little, you know, it's like, um, you know, we don't, I think most of the time women are not hiding pregnancies these days. So it's just, you know, just these little, these little, like I said, I like to call it shining the light where you just step back for a second, or you could argue maybe you're zooming in a little bit and kind of just saying like, as the author, like, remember the world that we're talking about is a very different world than the world that you're living in as you sit and read this book. Right, because I think we get we get so immersed in that world as we're doing the research that we forget um, how little our reader might 
know about it or maybe need to be reminded of. Right. Yeah. Well, and I'm always, I mean, I mostly, because it's a continuing studies course, I mostly teach, um, you know, sort of mid-career or retired individuals who are um, looking to start new projects. But I am always thinking about how to engage younger people with biographies and with nonfiction. Um, I have very small children, so I think about it on like a on that level, but just in general that like, you know, um, biographies are such a useful teaching tool. And that's one great reason and argument for making, um, you know, for writing scene driven work that has a really strong beginning that makes readers want to keep reading is that you, if whoever you're writing about, it could be people's introduction to this person. And it could be, um, you know, not to speak with too much hyperbole, but it could be life-changing. You know, I think everybody who's sitting in this Zoom room has had the experience of being introduced to a subject that they have become so taken with that they are willing to take their time and money and energy and all these things to want to learn more about them. And if we can do the same thing for our readers, like that's like the best, the best. Right, the best. right. Yeah. I think we have enough time to look at another scene. Did you? Okay. There was one on page 26 that you mentioned before. Is that the mm -hmm. one you want to look at? 26. Let me see. Oh, what yes. I love it. Well, it's, before, we, before we segue to, um, to page 26, the one thing that I, I will say, the note that it, one of the notes that I made in preparing for this conversation was that the lunar landing is, I think, one of the scenes that already I have really referred students to for, you know, the, how, how could you build a really great beginning and build these different viewpoints in, but the operation baby lift actually spans two chapters, but the operation baby lift scenes were the ones that I read aloud to my husband. So, I mean, that's just like this interesting anecdote of like, what's, what strikes the reader. And, you know, some of those moments were just so emotional and, and the, the facts that she was able to pull out, you know, the, the man that carries the babies, the premature babies on board in a box. I mean, some of these, you know, images are haunting. I mean, I may never forget them. So it's just, you know. Uh, I think what must, I mean, we can ask Julia, but I think what um, Karen wrote about that experience. Right. After she did go home and write about it. Yes. Published that. And so what a great resource for Julia to use. And obviously um, she made the most of it, right? So if you have something that, you know, describes the scene, in that way, which her piece obviously did, um, you know, that was written at the time period, right? That's gold. And yeah, literally. That'll, yeah. that'll be so much more than any interview, you know, mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40, 50 years after, after the fact, right? So, um, and it's such a moving moment. And it's when the three women come together. Which is so right? brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I, Finally, I remember when I hit that moment and I was, like I said, I was really reading for story. <laughs> and then you just have that moment as a reader where you're like, oh my gosh, it's all those people. It's all these people that I know. And now they're finally in the same room. And in a way it felt almost like a play or something like that, where you right. just went on stage. And we, we talked before about the choices, right? That a writer has to make. And we obviously love the beginning and we think Julie made wonderful choice, um, giving us that tipping point when the story really starts of her walking into the Pan Am building um, and putting us in, you know, the eyes of one person. Another, another thing I had thought of, I don't know, well, this is work, how well this would work, but it might be interesting to try if you were writing, you know, this book, um, if you were working on a project like this, to start with the moment when the three women are together on the plane at this super dramatic moment, something that's, you know, not at all like what we would expect from stewardesses, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have these stereotypical ideas of what stewardesses do. They're just taking care of people, you know, they're putting on makeup, whatever. Um, and they have to wear high heels, all that stuff, right? But that is such, um, it's such a vivid moment that you could sort of tease with that at the beginning maybe, and, um, and then pull back to bring us back to the beginning. And these are how the women, you know, then we get to know the, each of the women individually and we know they're gonna come back together at some point, right? So the rest of the book is kind of building up to that moment. And then, um, uh, and then you have, 
uh, you know, sort of the backstories of the three women and how they got there, right? So we go back to starting with them getting their jobs and, and all of that. So I don't know, that was just another thought I had that would be another yeah. way. I do. think, it, and I think, I mean, it really just like for me proves, um, proves the point that, you know, great writing is like, you know, the most amazingly constructed garment of clothing or something like that, where it's like, where you, where it's when you look closer that you realize all of the detail or how the seams have been done so beautifully or the very tiny stitches, because, um, this book could have been written in a number of different ways and maybe was written in a number of different ways as she right. worked to um, settle on the right container that would hold the story. Um, and it isn't, I mean, the research is obviously so, so, so important, but it isn't just the research. It's the craft of crafting the research into a story and making those choices about, um, you know, <laughs> what if right. I start here instead of here? And then how does everything play out um, and hold the reader's attention for the you know um, duration of the entire book? Right, right. So do you wanna look at 26 real yes. quick? So 26, I just thought this was, um, so obviously pretty early on in the book, 26, page 26. Um, and it is, we are with Karen and um, it is one of her first flights to Puerto Rico and the captain calls her into the cockpit to look at Cuba below. Mm. I'm gonna read officially now. The island appeared enormous. Karen observed green fields of crops. She saw what she thought was a missile site with trucks coming and going and then lush mountains of variegated colors and very few people as the plane continued on. It was no wonder that the hijackers always went to Cuba. Airplane skyjackings had risen into the dozens every year and nearly all of the hijackers had directed the planes to Havana. True democracy, said one skyjacker. Karen left the cockpit to finish the drink service. When the plane had passed over Haiti and the Dominican Republic and was approaching San Juan, the captain again called Karen up to the front. Strap in, he said, gesturing at the seat behind him. She sat down as he narrated how he would land the plane. The co-pilot and the flight engineer chimed in, describing the function of different instruments, how the steering mechanism and the gauges worked. As the plane descended even lower, the ground rising towards the cockpit windows, the captain took his hand off the steering yoke and pointed at different sites, the good hotels, restaurants, and bars he had come to frequent while in Puerto Rico. The co-pilot and the flight engineer followed the captain's finger. The cockpit was now close enough to each of the buildings that Karen could make out window dressing and pedestrians walking into doorways. She felt the blood slide out of her cheeks. The men's focus snapped back to the task at hand and an instant later, the plane was on the ground and the men were laughing at Karen, the new girl startled by the simple landing. And I just remember, I just love that passage. I remember reading it and feel, I mean, I felt the blood <laughs> slide out of my cheeks and the, the bottom fall out of my stomach. And that is just, you know, again, um, that's, that's the, the research, but also the art of bringing the story to life on the page in a way that makes the reader, um, you know, want to keep reading. But I mean, by, I think I don't watch like literally any TV or movies or anything. I only read books right now in this phase of my life. But by the end of it, I was like, this could be a series. And I actually think they did do a flight attendant series, but, um, but there's just, you know, there's so much more drama. I mean, you know, that there's drama because it's putting a bunch of people into a metal container in the air, but you know, I just felt like there were so many, um, amazing dramatic scenes. We didn't even talk about the storyteller or the fortune teller, or the, did, oh, was it a, yeah. like, that's, you know, that moment, I mean, there are just so many great human stories. Um, and, uh, for anyone, you know, at home working on their own stories of quote unquote, ordinary people, I just do think that it's such a great example of how um, you can take, um, you know, you can do the research on those lives and dig out real, dig, dig up really amazing things that can become really wonderful stories. Yes, yes, and I'm so glad you read this scene because it is extremely vivid. There's so many great sensory details, and I was thinking of how how the prose flows so well, but it's not just flowing; it's like you feel the tension, right, of it. And I think one of the things um, that does that is the vivid uh, language that she uses in the very active verbs. Because yep. um, that is something that I think isn't, you know, isn't something that we as nonfiction writers are necessarily thinking about is sentence structure, 
and making sure we're using active verbs, that we have actors in the sentence doing something in particular, avoiding passive voice, for instance, right? Um, but I love this image of the, um, where was it? I just had it. As the plane descended ever lower, the ground rising toward the cockpit windows, right? I mean, that's just so, yeah. <laughs> so you're in the cockpit with her, right? Or with them, with her in particular, I guess, being the newbie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you do this, but I, um, I love to read other people's work aloud when I have an excuse to do it. Um, but I always, always, always read my own work aloud. And I think the, the combination of the two sort of occasionally reading other people's work aloud to see how that like pu published prose really does flow and can be very theatrical and dramatic and, um, you know, depending on the scene, flowy or slow or staccato or, um, you know, what have you, and then comparing, you know, my own clunky drafts and figuring out, you know, in real time sort of where things need to be fixed or where I need to take a closer look to like get things just right. It's one of my biggest, you know. Oh, when that's I a really good tip. Yeah, I tell that to students when they're writing, you know, short papers, always read it aloud to catch all your mistakes. But that's even better is to really notice the moments where your prose isn't flowing. I think because you're you're having to read it out loud and you have to breathe and pause, mm -hmm. um, you're going to notice where your sentences get a little convoluted. Or when you get bored, like if you're really reading something longer, longer than a paragraph, like if you find yourself trailing off or just kind of being like, oh, I'm going to skip ahead. Like those are the parts that you should highlight because that's what you don't want. Um, yeah, I, my seventh grade teacher used to have us go out into the hallway in, in junior high and read to the lockers. Um, we would face the lockers and read to the lockers. And ever since then, I have read everything aloud. Oh, right. A lot by ear for that way, for, for, because of that. So I have not seen very, I haven't really seen any questions at all in the chat yet. So please pop your questions in there. Um, there was a question earlier, um, wanting to know the title of the craft book that you assign in oh, your sure. class. Um, well, there are obviously um, a couple of very biography focused craft books, but for this more sort of introductory, um, writing class to some extent the the book that I assign is called telling I mean let me get the title right because it's a long one it is called um telling true stories I can drop the um drop the link into the the chat and it is a collection it's um edited by the Neiman Foundation at Harvard um and it's more focused on journalism. So um, I like it because the entries, if there's a lot of different voices, you're learning from a lot of different writers um, about research, about point of view, about fact checking, about finding the story, about organizing the story, just this whole gamut of um, kind of non-fiction, research journalism, non-fiction 101. So it's not specifically biography writing, but I find it can really help, especially if you're still getting your bearings for the genre. Right, All right. And I think- um, learning, But don't buy from Amazon, buy it from your local bookstore, sorry. <laughs> learning, learning, okay, Michael put the link in the chat for you all for the book that she uses, the craft book, but it's um, learning from journalists, I think is a really good idea because I mean, many of our members, um, our new writers, many of us are academics, you know, moving into this, um, this new form of biography. And I think uh, journalists can have a little bit of an edge on us in terms of really already having those story instincts. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I noticed in the biography there in the back or the author bio, Julia is, of course, a journalist, right? You can really see, see that coming through. Um, Okay, so there was a couple of, let's see, there was also a question about the length because you've mentioned you you picked a book that was shorter, mm -hmm. shorter biography. And I think, um, you know, there's so many doorstop biographies out there, right? Those tend to be of famous white men, um, not all of them, but many of them are. Um, I think Eleanor Roosevelt was like, it was amazing that she got a two volume, right. was it? To, but yeah, multi-volume yeah, biography. Yes. That's very unusual. And I think if you're telling the stories of lesser known people, 
um, yeah, a, a publisher is definitely going to limit how many words you can use. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we're writing, we don't know how many pages that's going to turn out to be in a book. But I can just tell people that my my first biography on Constance Farmer Wilson, who was not at all a well-known figure, um, they gave me 120,000 words, which I think was generous. Yeah. And um, my next book, I only got 80,000 words. <laughs> so it's like, I well. mean, I do. I mean, I don't know what you think, but I do think just in general, books are trending shorter. At the YouTube get these really big, exhaustive, often about men biographies. To be honest, the one that I really wanted to teach that I just decided was too long for this class was, um, and I'm sorry, because I can't off the top of my head remember the author's name, but the one about um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, which is so excellent. Um, that when the, the Pulitzer. Oh, Prairie. Uh, Prairie, Prairie Fires. Fires, Carolyn Frazier. Carolyn yes. Frazier. Um, and actually, it's with the end notes that it gets up towards a thousand pages, but it's just, you know, it's, it's just a little too hefty at this, especially to be, you know, just to be totally frank, I was also really had my eye on, um, you know, it's, it is a funny time and just feeling like I needed to pick a book that was not going to be overwhelming during a period of time where it was becoming clear that there were still going to be a lot of overwhelming things happening in the world. I definitely had this eye that I wanted to pick something that was going to be engaging and fun in the best possible way that people were going to look forward to reading and engaging with their classmates. Um, because there was, um, I just didn't want something that was going to be really big and heavy for this particular quarter. I pick a different book, you know, every quarter that I teach. Very rarely do I I'll teach the same craft book again, but I very rarely teach the same, you know, text literary book again. That's interesting. Yeah, I do that a lot too. Um, okay, well, Elaine is asking how, and how do we find out more about the classes that you offer? So maybe you could put a link or something in the chat mm -hmm. about that. You can do that. And um, I'm gonna see, there's some questions here um, about, using your sources, right, to create scenes, and how do you do that without shading into fiction? So um, Cecile says, could you give an example of the fine line between vivid prose that puts the reader in the subject's experience and the facts it's based on so we can learn how to craft a scene without writing fiction? And that's hard to do because we don't have the sources in front of us. Only the writer could do that for us. I don't know if, um, if Julia is still with us and if she'd be willing to talk a little bit about how she um, maybe, you know, the opening scene that gives so many details since we read that pretty closely um, or the, um, the moon landing, oh, the opening of the moon landing chapter is a good one too in terms of, um, um, you know, very vivid scene. But as Etta was asking, you know, you know, what was that based on? Because it's not one of the named stewardesses. So we, you know, we don't know. Um, what that was based on, but is Julia here, Michael? Hi, you... I am. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> can you spotlight her, Michael, so we can see oh, her? There she is. Hi. hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for featuring this. It's been so amazing to listen to you guys talking about it. I can't even tell you. It's just been that would be, it would really, be really, really wonderful. Talked about my book. Like it's a... so exciting. It's, it's really fun. Like really, really fun. Oh. Cool. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about how you, where you get the details from to really paint a scene? Like yeah. how to make sure that you're staying in the nonfiction realm rather than shading over into fiction? Well, so I was really, so first of all, um, whoever mentioned that um, the unnamed source is probably possibly not one of the three is correct. Um, that was, I interviewed many, many, many dozens of, of former stewardesses for this book before settling on um, the three primary characters and the two other, um, Claire and Hazel. So I had a ton of material, like a ton of interviews and so many like really vivid anecdotes. Um, pretty much every, every woman that I spoke to had something that was just really stand out and incredible. And it was really hard for me to winnow down all of those stories into, um, into something that, that 
was readable and made sense and felt cohesive. So that was one anecdote that I thought was just so remarkable and I really wanted to include it, um, but I, it, I didn't know how to other than making her anonymous. So yeah. um, <laughs> No, that, that makes correct. sense. I think it was definitely worth including. And it, it just kind of leads us into your three main characters then. But how, like in the opening of the book, um, where you're describing, um, you know, Lynn stood fonts and elegant French twists. Um, and, and the fact that she, um, as she walked out of the elevator, um, she walked up to the offices above as if she knew where she was going and what she was doing. So you're kind of getting us inside of her head a little bit. I'm assuming that was based on interviews that you did with her. Yeah. So my, my research process was really um, focused, I, I guided it by inter interviews. So everything, I spent a lot of time with each of these women, um, many, many interviews with, with each of the primary subjects. Um, and then for Lynn and Karen, they gave me all of their letters that they had sent home. Their mothers had saved them. So they had these huge folders filled with letters. Um, so I read the letters and then I would go back and interview them about what they described in the letters. And then I would read, read um, uh, secondary sources around what was being published at the time. So a really good anecdote is, um, a good example of this is the scene with, um, uh, in which Tori uh, is on the plane and, and these diplomats are kidnapped off of her flight. She told me about this story in an interview and I was like, that's bananas. There's no way that happened in the way that you're describing this. Um, that is just the craziest story I've ever heard. Um, this is at the very beginning of when I was thinking about writing this book. Um, and I went and looked at the New York Times and sure enough, they had three articles um, on the specific dates that she told me, um, reporting, corroborating everything that she said. Wow. Um, which was mind boggling for me. It just completely blew the story into a different dimension. Um, I had known that these women were really fascinating and, and I was really at that point just following my instinct that they were much more than ordinary, you know, people doing a, a, an anonymous job, that they were really doing something incredibly important and consequential. Um, and that anecdote completely solidified it for me and really galvanized my um, desire to, to write the book in the way that I wound up writing it. Um, so then I went and interviewed her again. And I kind of used those articles as like ways to kind of push her a little bit and say, okay, you, you told me about this, what about this? Um, you know, you mentioned this person did that. Um, do you, are you still in touch with her? Um, so then I got in touch with a couple of other people from the same flight and asked them the same things. And then I went and looked at an encyclopedia of world events. Um, and I looked at, um, you know, the, the history of Ghana and Guinea um, in that period and started reading about that geopolitical situation. Um, and so, it, and I just kind of toggled back and forth um, with every scene between um, interviews, letters, and then news articles, and then um, for Pan Am specific uh, content uh, archives. I went, I spent a lot of time in the Pan Am archives um, and reading about, you know, what, how these things were seen and approached um, from Pan Am's perspective, or, you know, um, I did a couple of FOIA requests and got some um, government documents, including a memo that was sent about that diplomatic kidnapping incident. So um, all of these different things then layered together to, to create the scene. Yeah. So not all of those sources are cited in your notes. And I'm assuming that was, um, is, am I right about that? And I'm, I'm guessing that your editors wanted you to keep the notes as trim as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we decided to just do notes that um, included that were, it was mostly the secondary sources and then the archival. Um, I just summarized all of the interviews um, and I didn't, um, I, I think I specified some letters, but not um, yeah. not all of them. It, it, it was, it got, at that point, it would have gotten really hairy. Right, right. And I've seen in some books that it's clear that they're just citing um, passages, the sources for passages that are direct quotes. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, the background stuff or where they're paraphrasing things, they wouldn't necessarily cite that. And, um, Which is maddening from a reader's perspective. Right. Like I, I find it, I find it. <laughs> from an academic perspective, it's like, I want to know where you came for that case. I know. I can go look it up too and maybe get something exactly. from it. Exactly. <laughs> but that's what editors, I wanted to trim. We were talking about how they wanted shorter books. Did you, shorter books these days, did you have a problem 
at all? Or what kind of challenges did you face in terms of meeting so, your limit? It's We're so interesting when, when um, Anne was saying that I chose to be uh, character focused and not necessarily chronologically. Um, that is that that was because of my editor. The, the first um, draft that I handed in was very, I think I'd gotten really bogged down in the weeds of research. Um, it was very like blow by blow, um, chronological. Uh, and, and she kicked it right back to me and said, you know what, I need this to be a lot more character driven. That's what you promised us. That's what is really um, interesting here. So I need you to just go back to this and really think about you know, um, the characters. So I sat down and um, made an outline for each of the women, uh, just in terms of um, if there are three acts of their, of each of their lives, I, I kind of looked at what I wanted, what each of those acts would contain. And then I um, did the same for, for the general era and for the different storylines that the book contains. So, you know, the feminist movement or the Vietnam War, um, I, I, I made three acts for each of them. Um, and then I worked at, at finding the overlay there. That's so interesting. So I'm sure we would all, yeah, would love, hear, I always love hearing these stories about how a book evolves and changes as you're writing it. And so you said you promised them the book, your editor thought that you were promising them. So what, what was the proposal like compared to the book you ended up writing? For instance, did you have your um, your main characters already chosen or all of the themes that you wanted to talk about were they, you know, did you have a blueprint for yourself or were you still in the exploratory stage or how did this change as you wrote it? You know, the, the proposal, so I had all the specific women that I wanted to, to highlight. Um, I included a couple of other people. Um, so there were, there were the three primary women and then there were actually, I think, um, three or four uh, sub you know the secondary characters um and a couple of them just didn't seem as um necessary in a way and that that's like it, it's always really heartbreaking to have to cut things that um you know there were a couple of anecdotes in the book that i thought were really incredible like a, a woman um who was married to a, a pan am executive who was living in saigon running the saigon office in 67 who flew off the airfield at eight and a half months pregnant under enemy fire, um, which I just found wow. incredible. Like the thought that, that these women were going through these kinds of things um, just as a matter of course. And, you know, her kind of sense of, of her place in the world really did mirror um, that of the stewardesses and that she really did just consider herself, you know, she was doing what, what had to be done. There was no sense of drama about it. And then, you know, I, I found that really interesting, but my editor and I agreed after looking at all of it, that, you know, the book is about the stewardesses and it needs to be focused on them. And so, you know, an executive's wife didn't really um, match that, uh, that, that theme. Um, even though I could have argued that it really was all about like the airline, the kind of culture that it fomented and, and the way that it supported employees or didn't um, and, you know, whatever. Anyway, point is that um, I, it did not change a huge amount from proposal to what I submitted, but it changed a lot between what I submitted to my editor and what wound up being published. Wow. Um. So did she um, have specific suggestions of how to structure the book? Because it sounds like you had to really change the structure of it. So she actually, she gave me a pretty free hand. I was really um, grateful for that. She had a couple of different suggestions, um, none of which I wound up taking, um, but they were just kind of batted or we just talked about them. Um, and um, I, it's so interesting what you were- What were the so options? She, how did you She choose? suggested, yeah, so she, she was like, she, she said, why don't you think about doing it um, in like one in three parts, each of which focuses on the experiences of one of the women. Um, but I couldn't really figure out a way to make that build toward anything. Um, my, my first book was about youth culture in Havana, and it was much more along those lines with, you know, seven or eight different chapters, each of which focused on a different person in a different scene. And while I found that really interesting to be writing, um, especially for that subject matter. Um, I was going into like a different scene in each chapter um, and together it, it built toward a, a, an image of what Havana was like for in that moment of time for those kinds of people. Um, I didn't think that that would be right for this chronology, for this this moment in time when it really was such um, 
such a mixing and a blending. And there were all of these different influences that were working together to, to create this kind of change that was all building together. It was really chaotic and interesting. And so I really wanted to, to work toward capturing that. And I thought that um, treating each woman discreetly wouldn't, wouldn't really um, do that. Um, I don't remember her other suggestions, but I remember um, having a very, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it sounds like you had so much material. Um, you had so many interviews, so many things that didn't make it in the book. Um, what do you, what have you done with all of that? Have you been able to repurpose it in any way? Or are you thinking about other projects where that might feed into that? Or is it just, you know, you know I have done nothing you, with it. Yeah. And I'm so regretful about that. And I really, in my mind, I had all of these grand plans to write all of these different essays around, um, around the book's publication. And um, full disclosure, I gave birth six weeks before the book was published. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. To twins. So um, I, wow, okay. was, um, <laughs> I didn't really have the, the focus yeah, yeah, um, yeah. to be yeah. doing a whole ton with that. Um, with that material so it's just sitting there and, and it, it just it 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 um it, it glows at me hey well you should definitely donate it to an archive or something if you end up not doing something else with it i could but I, listening to you talk i could almost imagine another book about you know the fall mm -hmm. of saigon or something or you know and using some of that material i don't know just it would depend on what you're interested in but um how did you come to this topic sounds like maybe through your your dad yeah um Accidentally through my dad, yes. Um, so he, my dad worked for Fan Am, but um, honestly, it was not. It was just like the source of, um, you know, family reminiscing over dinners. Uh, we have a lot of really weird and um, crazy anecdotes about the times when you know we got stuck in whatever place or the seven flights we had to take to go to Australia before the Pacific routes were sold when I was three, and you know, um, that's kind of what it was limited to in 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 my life. Uh, but when my, after my Cuba book came out, um, uh, my husband and I were just talking and, and he was like, why don't you just think about writing something about Pan Am? And he's like, I don't really know. I have no ideas, but, um, I was like, I have no ideas. I want to write another book. What am I going to write about? So I just started going to a couple of the Pan Am historical foundation events, um, just out of curiosity and then, you know, maybe I'll find something to write about. And I wound up talking to a bunch of these former stewardesses and I was completely fascinated by them. I just thought they were the most interesting, um, strange and wonderful people I'd ever met in my life. They seemed to be this like bizarre combination of um, very sophisticated and put together, but really irreverent um, and, and very, um, you know, they talked really intimately about uh, events of geopolitical history that I barely knew about. Um, and I thought that was so remarkable. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I was what, um, around 20, I was 30 at that point. And, um, and I considered myself a feminist in every way. Uh, but I found myself being like, you know, these women seem really smart for stewardesses. Um, yeah. How is like, and then I, and then I appropriately felt a high degree of shame for that response um, and that kind of, you know, knee jerk reaction. And so that seemed to me to be a place to dig into. Like, why had I, um, as someone who really knew all about um, structural inequities and the ways that women were treated and pigeonholed and how beauty can be a curse and, you know, all of these different things, um, why was, how was, how was I reacting that way? That, that was really embarrassing. Um, and so that's what sent me into it. And how did you pick the three to, that you focused on? They're just giving you um, material or what, what, and there's that moment where they all come together. So maybe that was another. Yeah. So Tori was among the first women that I interviewed um, overall. Uh, and then um, after Tori and Karen were two of, of the, you know, the first, let's say two dozen women that I interviewed. Um, and after interviewing a whole lot more women, I knew I, I wanted something that would bring them all together in some way, uh, whether that be that they were part of um, a graduating class together or that they had all been on a flight together. Um, and eventually I realized that the, the Vietnam War sections were really where the heart of it was for me because that seemed to me to really capture uh, this duality between women who really like respected rules but also broke them, uh, women who were really 
glamorous um, and adhering to these very, you know, patriarchal norms of femininity, but also incredibly gritty and, you know, um, really very much empowered and yeah. they they were very much themselves. And so to me, that, that Vietnam War story really, really um, shown and an, an, shown a really interesting light on that, that duality. Um, so at that point, when I realized that Vietnam was going to be an important thread, um, I, I realized that I wanted um, to find three women who had all been on that flight. Um, and so then I, I found Lynn. Oh, okay. And then, and then yeah. Karen wrote about it. So maybe that's how you found her. So yes, exactly. That's how I found Karen. And then after I talked to Karen and Tori, I then um, sent emails out to like everyone I'd ever interviewed and just said, um, if you know of another person who is not either Tori or Karen, who has been on this flight, um, please tell me and please put them in touch with me. Like I'd like, love to speak with them. Um, and then I found Lynn and that was amazing. These are such great stories. I feel like we could talk to you all night. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for um, for joining us and and talking to us here at the end. I think it's just been really super interesting. And did you have any else anything else you wanted to say, Anne? Um, I did at one point, but it's one I got kind of sidetracked by the story. Um, I mean, it was I just um, oh I know it was just very anecdotal. My um, my husband's aunt flew domestically at the same time. And it's so funny because she um, lives in Texas and pre-pandemic would come to the Bay Area, which is where I was living at the time, twice a year. She's a very brisk woman, twice a year to have lunch with her stewardess friends. And I was always like, what? She's flying all the way just to have lunch. And just very, very personally, this just kind of like illuminated um more of what her experience was like and that sort of um, camaraderie and, and just how you would you would definitely form lifelong bonds with people. And it would be like one of those things where like, these are the only people I can talk to about this stuff. We have both shared this completely wild and wacky experience. So um, yeah, just very personal. Personally, I'm excited to talk to her more and it was just very illuminating. And as you can tell, I love the book and it's been great to teach. So it's fun to have you pop in. Yeah, and, and I don't, it has been really fun. And Julia, I don't know if you had a chance to read any of the chat, but um, somebody talked about uh, her mother going to interview for a job at Pan Am and being told she was too short. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me tell you about as a, as a woman in this day and age, reading um, what the, what the like hiring people said about the people who it, 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 it is, it makes your skin crawl. Like the, the degree to which they, the objectification was just so. Too short, yeah. Did they, but did they measure them? Well, I know somebody was. They measured about them. They them. weighed yeah. them. They had them stand up and walk around, and then they were. Some of the notes were like too dumpy, or you know, just really mean, just not not nice. Really, I mean, yeah. And I wanted to point out that Karen Usus put in a comment saying that she flew Pan Am from 1970 to 1980. So maybe your next book should be about female pilots. <laughs> It'd be interesting. Yeah, that's um, amazing. But she says, I can tell you there are as many stories as there were individual flight attendants. The backgrounds of flight attendants from around the world were varied and were part of what made this such a rich experience. And I think was, you really have yeah. that. I wanted to be a flight attendant, which I've never <laughs> thought before in my life after reading your book. Um, so, uh, and Cheryl wants to know what's next. I can actually talk about it because I just, um, I am, uh, I got an offer on my next book this week, which I'm Oh, about. wonderful. Um, yeah. So I'm writing a book about a group of women um, journalists in the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, who I argue um, uh, invented the new journalism before, uh, long before Tom Wolfe and uh, the whole crew did it. These were women who were, were really diverse and interesting writers of not only journalism, um, other kinds of either nonfiction or fiction. Um, they include Martha Gellhorn and Rebecca West and Emily Hahn um, and a number of other women. Um, and so it's kind of a- it, it, Martha Gellhorn came immediately to mind when you started talking. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so they all actually knew each other, um, even just if, um, somewhat distantly, uh, but they were, they were basically all kind of writing um, either in concert or in competition with one another throughout this um, era. 
Right, right, right. Fascinating. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. And I just wanted to point out that Michael um, put the link for bio, uh, for bio in the chat. And if you're not a member, um, we certainly would in, would love to have you. And uh, it's the the URL, if you're watching this later, is just biographersinternational.org. So that's where you can find us. And Maxine says, I wanted to be stewardess at Pan Am or Braniff, but they didn't hire females who wore glasses. That's pretty bad. Which I was remember- actually how they got um, a whole ton of like how a lot of the different um, um, like attractiveness or, you know, the, the stupid uh, height and weight requirements got um, uh, were challenged in the courts via the eyeglasses requirement. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And you talk about race, too, and what it was like mm-hmm. for black women and Asian women and, and women from around the world. And I think for it sounded like for an airline like Pan Am that they wanted to present an international picture of themselves. And we do see that in the photographs that you included in the books and the advertisements and things, which is interesting. Um, but Hazel was such an interesting figure too. And you you had some good stories from her. Um, and she's, is she, is she someone that you met early on or did she come up later? She came up later. I, at some point, um, realized that I really wanted, uh, well, needed to include the, the story of, of the racial integration of Pan Am um, because it was happening at the same time. And because the, the, the women's stories are just, they're, they're, they're so potent and they, they really do shine um, an entirely different light. They, they show a, a different lens of, of the same thing. Um, so I, <laughs> what the, the irony was that I really wanted to write about the USSR um, and I wanted to write about black stewardesses, but I did not that want so to, I didn't know how part. to, well, yeah. I, and, and I was like, okay, I can't have there be more people. This is already overpopulated. People aren't going to be able to keep track of all of these different people. What am I going to do? Okay, I just need to focus on finding, you know, a Black stewardess who will talk to me, who was hired in that era. Um, a number of the women were very protective. Um, I think that a number of them want to write their own books, so they didn't want to talk to me, which I completely understand and respect, obviously. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, the 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 story of the, they call themselves the Blackbirds, um, so that their story is, is very, um, so much bigger than, than what Hazel's story um, could, could give me access to. Um, so I'm really hoping that um, a, a, a writer of color um, really addresses that story, uh, either with um, a, another woman or, um, or I hope that one of these women themselves publish what I hope will be amazing memoirs. Um, so, there's, there's that. So anyway, so I found Hazel and I thought that was great. Um, and then I asked her just offhand, have you ever been to Moscow? Did you ever take the Moscow route? She's like, oh yeah, I loved going to Moscow. And I was Perfect. like, yes! <laughs> yes. It was great. Yeah. Breakthrough. Great. Yep. Oh, I just love hearing stories, Julia. Thank you so much. And thank you and, so much uh, for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you came in and thank you so much. This has just been so informative and I loved, you know, drilling down into some of these passages with you. That was really fun. It's always fun to talk shop. <laughs> it is, it is. I, you know, I think we do it all night. In fact, I think the longest um, bio Zoom workshop we've had. So that just gives you an indication of, <laughs> of how rich the discussion was. So thank you both very much. And thank you, Michael, for doing the hosting duties. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. So we'll see you. We're hoping to do another one of these next month and we'll be sending out an email about that. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.